from the European Southern Observatory, and he will talk about astronomy and emotions. Please give a big hand of applause to Ferdinando. So thank you very much also to, to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I think it's a great opportunity. And I like to start with was, with was was my campus party back in 1978. That's me here. And at that time, I had great dreams. And some of them became reality, in fact. Um, the technology was still rather poor. That's my telescope that I built myself. You can see there are pieces of bicycle here. There's a pipe, a plastic pipe, then there's an old clock here, and this is a tripod made of wood. And that's the telescope which I used to watch the Halley Comet passage in 1986. Since then, I have a dream about astronomy, big telescopes. And of course, I could not have imagined at that time, that at some point I would have ended up at the largest telescope on the planet. That's me on the platform of the very large telescope in the Atacama Desert, 3,000 meters above the sea level, in the middle of nowhere, watching the stars. So this presentation is about emotions, but enhanced through high tech. You will see that astronomy, as you have already seen in the previous talk, Astronomy meets high technology, and it's a compromise between emotions, philosophy, science, and mankind somehow. Also, that I don't know well, a few of you would recognize that person. If you know Pink Floyd, then you know the dark side of the moon. And if you know the dark side of the moon, you know Alan Parsons, who was the sound engineer in that particular uh, LP, and that's Alan Parsons and myself. So that's one thing that astronomy gives you. You travel quite a bit around the world. And well, there are some young people here. I think I will be able to inspire a few of them. I certainly did that with those two small astronomers of tomorrow. But so let's start. I, as I promised, I would transmit to you some emotions. And the first approach you have to astronomy, of course, it is photons. And the photons are the particles that made up electromagnetic field. And that's the only way we have to perceive the universe. Astronomy is a pretty peculiar science. It's almost a pseudoscience because the scientists cannot interact with the object of study. It's like loving a girl without being able to touch her. She's very far. You can only see her beauty through the photons. That is what astronomy is. And so I decided to start with a series of pictures. There's no computer simulation there. This is what nature delivered to us, provided that we had eyes big enough and sensitive enough to see those colors. So those have been taken with a very large telescope. You will, I will explain a bit what they are. But what is important is that the first thing that hits your eyes is the photons and the beauty they convey from the depths of the universe. This morning there was a very nice talk by Stuart that went through the history of the early history of astronomy and you have seen Galileo. You know, he was in Padua in 1630 and he pointed the telescope for the first time up to the sky. It was the 30th of November and from that night on the universe has not been the same. And no matter how many times you have seen a starry sky, it always gives you emotions. Now, of course, I am a scientist, I am an astrophysicist, I spend all my life in trying to understand, in my particular case, supernovae, which are big explosions in the universe, but still, there is a fascination which you never forget. So I go down to Chile, you will see what I mean, I go down to Chile every year, and no matter how many times you have seen that kind of sky, it always hits you. So what you have seen here is pictures of stars forming, star forming regions, galaxies, planetary nebulae, planets, and all sorts of disordered media in the universe. So once we, have, we were told that the astronomy gives you an idea of the order of the universe, which is not true. The universe is absolutely disordered. You have seen this morning that we are not even able to describe to a high precision the solar system and how the bodies move and we basically if you want to know the truth we haven't understood anything about it we have just scratched the surface nevertheless 
what I find astonishing and sometimes even moving is the fact that notwithstanding those difficulties, we still try to understand the universe. Now, so I work at the European Southern Observatory. It is the European Organization for the Astronomical Research. It has the same structure of CERN. It, it actually was born almost together with CERN in 1962 in Geneva. They were hosted in the same building. And in the 80s, it moved to Germany. That's Garchen, it's close to Munich. And it collects 15 member countries from Europe, including the Czech Republic, Swiss, Sweden, Italy, Austria, Portugal, Spain, the UK. And we manage the largest astronomical ground-based facility on the planet. You have seen four 8.2-meter telescopes. Then there's a big antenna, that's the Cerro Paranal, that's the, uh, the new technology telescope. Then we have the 2.2, the 3.6, the Apex, and the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. We serve something like 3,000 astronomers all over the world. And you will be surprised to learn that the world astronomical community in the world it's 10,000 people, and I discovered this morning that is half of the participants in this campus party here. So that's a small community, but still that's a very big organization. So there are um, about 600 people working in Garkin. It's mainly optoelectronic engineers, software, uh, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, and a tiny amount of astrophysicists. Because we build, we design, and we manage telescopes and astronomical instrumentation. So the European Southern Observatory serves a community like CERN, where you have an idea, you have an experiment in your mind, and then you come to us and you propose observations. And as you've seen here, there are a number of telescopes that are placed in Chile. So I want to talk to you about the very large telescope. This is the sun going down. That's the Pacific Ocean on the other side. And I want to show you, well, that's Cerro Paranal in 1991 when the work started, so here at the top. And then it was decided to blow it up, exploding a few million cubic meters of material. So they cut the top of the mountain so that you have a flat place, which is a bit more or less as big as this hole here in the airport. And then immediately after the civil works started, it's in the middle of the desert. The closest inhabited place is at 130 kilometers, which is Antofagasta, which is a mineral harbor in northern Chile. This is a major construction. You have to imagine that the mirrors of the telescopes, you, you know, you have your camera and you have a small length, like in that phone, the, sm the length is that small. In a binocular, you have a length which is of that size. Here, you don't have a length because it's too big. It's a mirror and it is 8.2 meters in diameter, which is more or less as big as the screen here. And this weights 20 tons, and this glass, it's only 20 centimeters thick, and it has a hole in the center. As you see there, so it was transported, it took a week to transport it from Antofagasta to the top of the mountain and install it up there, and there are four of them. They were manufactured here by Schott in Germany. They were brought to France for the polishing, and then they went through the Panama Channel, they went, and they went down to the Pacific Harbor of Antofagasta, and with that big truck, they were brought up. And the first light of the telescope, of the first of the four telescopes, started in 1998. Now, you see, it's a very complex machine. We'll see more here. So here you have an idea of where it is. So that's Chile, it's Antofagasta to the north, this is Google Earth, you can see it easily yourself. So you, the, the Andes is 12 kilometers from the coast. That's the mountain top, which was cut, and you see the four telescopes. And then you have a computer animation with real um, altimetry. Everything is real, so it's the, the shuttle or other topographic mission data. And it was just vested with real color. So you see the top of the mountain that was cut up here. The four telescopes and the small auxiliary telescopes. These telescopes here have two meters in diameter, but they disappear in comparison to those. Those dome here, uh, they weigh 400 tons, and the telescope weighed more or less the same, and they can move with a precision which is extreme. It's like, it's more or less the angle that a bee subtends at five kilometers from your eye. 
they can point to a very high precision. Now I will show you some more technology about this. So this is the base camp and this is Residencia, where actually one of the 007 movies, the Quantum of Solace, was shot. That was La Perla de las Dunas at that time, that was chosen by Peter Craig. So, and this is the night sky in Paranal. It's quite unfortunate that we, we have lots of light pollution here, but this is a normal picture taken with a, a normal digital camera. These are the four telescopes which are moving because they are following the sky. That's the Milky Way. That's our galaxy. And our galaxy has a hundred billion stars, like the sun, more or less. And if you point a telescope, well, this is another picture taken with a normal camera. This is dust that obscures the center of a galaxy, which is more or less here. But if you point a big telescope to one small spot on that image, this is what you see. And each of those small things here, those are stars. A hundred billion. And if you use a deeper exposure in between the stars, you would see other galaxies like ours, a hundred billion of galaxies, each of them hosting a hundred billion of stars. And this gives you an idea on about how small we are, in fact. Now, that's Chile. So you may wonder why establishing such a big machine in, in, uh, in South America. So this is Chile. This is the Atacama Desert. It's only 400 kilometers wide here. So this is the Pacific Ocean, that's the South Pole. These are clouds. The, 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 the sea is so cold because there is the Humboldt current coming from the South Pole that all the humidity from the sea condenses on the top of the sea and it rains. On the other hand here you have the Andes which reach 6,000 meters, almost 7,000 in fact, and all the clouds coming from Brazil Peru, Colombia, they stop there, and as an effect, you have the driest strip on the planet, which is the Atacama Desert. As you will see, it's very similar to Mars, for those of you who have been there. The only difference is that it is very, well, you can breathe, it's very dry, and it's full of rocks, so this is just a shot out of the, of the off-road car that we take to go on the top, and it's full of stones, and you may wonder why, because you can do the experiment if you pull such sand in a bucket plus some stones and you shake it strongly, at some point the stones come up. And this is because Chile is a very seismic region, in fact. Um, this we have already seen, so we can skip and we move to the next. And, well, it is simply astonishing. So that's when you are on the top of the mountain, that's the Pacific Ocean, and those are the clouds that you, you saw from the space shuttle. That was a picture taken from the space shuttle. So that's the inversion layer, as it is called. The sun goes down, and this clear, the sky is absolutely clear. So that's the residencia, that's the place where we live, where we go down there, and it's very dry. The typical humidity in Paranal is between 5 and 10%. Here we have about 85 or something like that. Well, a few days ago we had even 90 or so. So it was decided to build a small uh, garden, a tropical garden, with a swimming pool here, just to establish some humidity. That's a tropical garden. That's a place where you eat. There's a canteen. And that's a typical set of the, the so-called hotel. Of course, as I said, it's about emotions as well. That's a picture taken by one of, of, of my friends. That's a comet here. It's a pity you cannot see it all, but it has a very extended tail, and that's, that's Venus. And this is the silhouette of one of the auxiliary telescopes. So that's the base camp seen from the top. You can see the residencia and the garden, it's in the air and the shadows going down. So you see now we are at sunset, and this is the shadow of Paranal projected on, to on the top of the atmosphere, and this blue strip that you see coming up, that's the shadow of the Earth. We have the sun going down on our shoulders, and it, it projects a shadow, the Earth itself, onto the atmosphere itself, and here there is the sunset, this is the night sky, 
and this is the shadow of the earth. It's something that you can only see in such places. Now, that's a telescope. You see the big mirror here, 8 meters in diameter, 20 tons in weight. That's myself. And this gives an idea on how big the machine is. So this point here is about 30 meters above the floor, which is something like this. So when you are, when you are on the inner part of the dome of the enclosure, it's something like the feeling is something like that. And that's the instrument. So if you take the, an example, that camera there, the objective, it's the telescope, is this thing here. That's the objective. And the camera itself is that small thing there, which is as tall as a man, more or less. So that's the mirror after polishing. And this gives you an idea, this is a man. So what happens is that this mirror is slightly concave. The light comes down. This is then made to converge at some 30 meters away from the mirror. There is another mirror here, which sends back the light through this hole in the center. And the, the light comes out here, down here. And here you put your camera. So that's the objective. That's the main length of the objective. Now, why do I show this picture? So this was the Council of ISO at that time. And this is Riccardo Giacconi, the director of ISO at that time, who got the Nobel Prize in physics in 2003. And I also am also proud to announce that the last Nobel Prize in 2011, in the team that got the Nobel Prize, well, my boss and another friend of mine at ISO were part of that team. So the mirror, it's, well, it's something like this. It's a big circle like this. It's only 20 centimeters thick. So you can imagine that you mount it on a piece of metal, you have seen the cell, and you will see more of it later on. When you point it in the direction of the star, the gravity starts to act in a, in a differential way across the surface, which means that the mirror would start to collapse on itself and deform. And this would produce a crappy image. So what did we do about that? So you put it on top of piezoelectric actuators that are 134, controlled in real time. There is a reference star observed each time. And you, know, you do the wavefront sensing, you analyze the shape, you send back the controls to the sensors, and you correct in real time the shape of the main mirror so that you maintain a perfect shape, and you're able to get very sharp images. Now, this is the cell that holds the mirror. And that's your FLR camera, in fact. This is an imager. So as I explained, it works like this. It's pretty easy. So the, sun, the light comes down here. There's a mirror is there. It's made to converge here. This mirror here seems very small, but is one, one meter and 20 centimeters in diameter. So it's a big thing. It's many, well, I don't think in Germany there are telescopes bigger than that, in fact. And then the light is made to converge down here, where those guys here are, and where the instrument here is. And then you can put your CCD, your detector, and you take a picture, in fact, or a spectrum, as you will see. Now, during the night, you can also insert 45 degrees mirror here so that you can send the light here and if you rotate you can send the light there why you would say well during the night I may want to take pictures so to speak but I also may want to take spectra or I may want to do polarimetry or interferometry so I, I may want to change instrumentation and in fact this whole thing has two big platforms which are well as big as this as the place where you're sitting on one side and on the other side, which host instrumentation, like the FLR camera, which weight may be 20 tons. So this is an instrument that analyzes the light coming from here. The telescope is there. These are people. This gives you an idea on how big these instruments are and how complex they are. So they are complicated pieces of optomechanical engineering. That's the holder of the secondary mirror you see on the top. As I said, that's one meter and 20. That's a 45 mirror, 45 degree mirror. And that's a detail of the instrument. Now, this is your FLR camera. It's this thing here. So this is German made rock solid. It's called Force. And it's a, it's a multi uh, mode instrument. It can do imaging spectroscopy, which means splitting the light. Polarimetry, which means analyzing the direction of oscillation of the electromagnetic field and many other fancy things. 
So this is a view of the top and how the telescope operates. So there are louvers, they are com controlled by computers to keep a steady flow of the wind through the dome. They open and the telescope can move in all directions. It weighs 400 tons, but you can push it with a finger. It's on a hoil sheet and it, it can rotate very easily. And so this is night time with full moon so that you could see the telescope. It's a time lapse. And then there are a series of images that give you an idea of what you can see with these telescopes. And here there are some nice pieces of high-tech stuff inside of the instrumentation. You have to imagine that the detector of an FLR camera, it's not cooled, it works at, at room temperature. Now, the signal in astronomy is always so small that the noise, the thermal noise produced by the detector is orders of magnitude higher than the signal coming from the galaxies and the stars. So if you would expose for one hour, for instance, which is a typical thing, you would just get only noise. What do you do? Then you cool it down. I have seen some li liquid nitrogen this morning. You cool it down for the optical to minus 170 and for the near infrared close to the absolute zero with liquid helium. It means that those instruments have some vessels and the detector, so meaning the chip which is in the camera, is cooled down, in a, is, it takes a bath in liquid helium. Of course, uh, I, I must mention that these things are pretty expensive, in fact, but not as much as space missions. <laughs> now, so for some reason it stopped working, but okay, let's see here. Yes. So, and that's the control room. So the control room of the telescope is some three or four hundred meters from the telescope itself. And from there, you can control the telescopes. The data are sent directly to Europe via a satellite link in Garching. And then they are distributed to the users through the web, in fact. So you, you apply for time, you get the time, and the observations are done for you by somebody, a professional observer. And then at some point, you get the data either via FTP, HTTP, or a DVD, or a Blu-ray, whatever you prefer. And then your job starts at that point. Now, you may wonder, what are we doing with those telescopes? Now, I lots of things, but I only want to show you an example which will mo most likely lead to a Nobel Prize. You may know that there is a German team based in Garching, and the PI of the team is Reinhard Genzel, and for 15 years they have been using the ESO telescope to watch the center of the galaxy. You may also know that at the center of the galaxy there is a black hole. So their purpose was to measure the mass of this black hole because they wanted to do some work in the direction that Scott mentioned this morning, they want to test gravity in high force conditions. So what they did is, in principle, as usual, once somebody has told you, very simple. They took pictures for 15 years of the galactic center every second month, looking for movements of stars. And after 15 years, they put everything together, you make a movie, you fit the orbits, and out of that you are able with the Keplerian laws to measure and actually general relativity to measure the mass of the central black hole which turns out to be three times 10 to the six solar masses which means three million times the, the mass of the Sun so it's a massive black hole and that's the first time that this is seen directly because as you as you know a black hole you can't see him it's black and it's a hole. The only thing you can say is the you can see is the effect it produced on the surroundings. So this is an animation, but so each of those stars is real, and it's an animation, and those are the reconstructed orbits, and the black hole is in the center. Now, a few months ago, they discovered a cloud of gas, which is pretty cold, say 47 degrees Kelvin, which is approaching the black hole and it's going to fall into it next year. That's the first time we see this, and they are going to test general relativity on the fly, seeing the material going through. This is what they expect to see. It's a, it's a hydrodynamical simulation. So the cloud, this is 2002 when they started. It was like a star, and then it was de developing a kind of a tail. 
so the material gets accelerated. This is this year, in 2013, it will go, go very close to the black hole. It will be disrupted and some of the material will fall into the black hole. That's the first time in mankind that we will see really a black hole working and we will see whether Einstein was right or not, at least in this particular. And of course the phenomenon, you see the other stars, the other stars going around the black hole in the center, which we don't see, is marked by this dot here, but it's just for you to see where it is. And the stars, they get close and they accelerate, as we know in, in, in general relativity. Now, I want to do an experiment with you. The instrument I've shown before, it's an infrared spectrometer, so it can take infrared spectra. Now, most of you will probably know what an infrared thing is, but I wanted to explain you. The picture you have seen before was in the visible, so the light that our eyes see, which is only a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know that using your cell phone, well, you don't see the waves coming out of, of the cell phone, but still, they are of the same nature of the light, of the photons through which you see me and I see you. It's only that our eyes are not sensitive. The same is true for the infrared. We are warm, and if we look with an infrared camera, you would see them. So, the fact is that when you look in the infrared, as you have seen, you see very different things, because the infrared light goes through dust. You can make the experiment at home with wine. I was not allowed to bring it here, but... So, what I want to show you... Let me see whether I can manage. Okay, now you see a picture of me. So I switched on the webcam of the laptop, and this is the, re the Apple remote control, which I will, s I will use now in a very improper way. I will use it as a source of infrared radiation. Now, I push the button, and what do you see? Nothing. But if I put it close to the camera, oh, yes. Do you see it? So you can see simultaneously my finger my camera here and the screen and you see that your eye does not see the source but the infrared camera of the apple does see it so this is an example of an astrophysical source which your eyes do not detect but an infrared detector does in astronomy we do that all the time we look to inf to, from the ultraviolet, actually in the X-rays, and the ultraviolet, to the microwaves, to the near and far infrared, to the radio domain. So let's move on to the next thing of physics, which is spectroscopy. Again, this is an experiment that you usually do with kids, you can do it at home. So this is your spectrograph, it's a DVD or a CD, you turn it, and you see some colors. These are two astrophysical sources. Now, you know because you see them that here this is a tungsten bulb, so there is a filament which is then, the, the electrons go through it and they hit each other and they heat the filament which emits photons. The other one is a fluorescent lamp, one of those that you use to save energy. So, they produce light in using two very different physical mechanisms. Now, suppose that I bring these two lamps a million years, light years away from here, you will not see what they are, you would just see their light. How do you recognize, and especially, how do you measure the physical conditions which are inside of the bulbs? You do this. You take a spectrum. This is your spectrograph. You place it close to the light in this case, and you watch what happens. You see there is a green band, then there is nothing, then there is a red band, and then there is nothing. This is the bulb lamp, and there is a full rainbow. So this is called the continuum spectrum. This is called an emission line spectrum. If I am clever enough, I can use some gas in the lab. I use helium, mercury, cadmium, and I try to reproduce this, and from that, I can tell you, haha, on the sun there is hydrogen, helium, and so on and so forth. This is how we do it. Another thing which Gero Ruprecht will tell you on Saturday is that the lines, if you take this lamp and you run very fast, and I take the spectrum, these lines would move. If you go away, they will move to the red. So this green line here will become orange. If you run very fast in my direction, then those would turn blue. So there's a blue shift and a red shift. And from this you can tell how fast the material moves. And this is from that that, for instance, when I take a spectrum of a supernova, I can tell you that there is a solar mass of gas, so there is some, so much gas as the gas contained on the sun moving at 10, 
20, 30,000 kilometers a second, a tenth of the speed of light. This gives you an idea on how powerful a supernova explosion is. But we could only understand that because of this very simple principle. Once somebody has explained that to you, of course. Now, I'm close to the end. And that's the future projects. Okay, ALMA is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. We are 300 kilometers from Paranal, 5,000 meters above the sea level. That's the Altiplano. It's close to San Pedro de Atacama. That's a volcano. This is how it used to be. And that was a, a computer simulation a few years ago. This machine here was manufactured here in Germany. And the purpose of that machine is to bring up these antennas from the base camp at 2,000 meters up to 5,000 meters where you need to work under pressurized oxygen. Otherwise, it's too complicated. And the idea is to place these antennas to observe the universe in the microwave. It's something that our eyes do not see. It's the radiation that you use to cook milk in your microwave oven. We have a different view on it, but that is more or less the same principle. But this has now become reality. So these are real antennas now. That's the same place. It's not a computer animation. It's real, so the ha half antennas are Italian, uh, sorry, they are European, then they are um, and from the US. And this is a real time lapse. You see, the, you see the, the clouds coming through, the Milky Way moving, and the antennas pointing synchronously the objects. The idea is to observe the origin of galaxies because the microwaves penetrate the dust and you can see very, very far. Something that in the optical does not simply happen. The next project, and I am proud to announce that it has just been approved by the ESO Council, is the construction of the biggest telescope on the world. Here the diameter of the mirror is going to be 40 meters, which I measured this morning is something from here to the end of the building. That's going to be a mirror composed by 1,000 segments of one meter each. They are hexagons, it's like, like an... an it's a puzzle of small pieces. Well, as you guess, I'm Italian, so I like to make the comparison with the Coliseum. This is our, and we are proud of, the VLTs, so they are four eight-meter telescopes, but they disappear in comparison to that. If you have seen the Allianz Arena close to Munich or any big stadium, that's the order of magnitude we are talking about. So there is there a telescope with an enclosure which is as big as a stadium. This has been approved for construction. It's a 1 billion euro project. It's a small amount of money, in fact. However, it's not that easy to find it. Well, if you think that the LHC, so the Large Hadron Collider in, in, at CERN, the price of that is seven times more. So this gives an idea. It's, it's a big number and a small number at the same time. Of course, this is challenges, challenging, and it brings me back to my emotional part at the end. Why are we doing this? Well, one of the big things we want to do is to take imaging and spectroscopy of planets. Now, as, as we heard this morning, as of today, we know about 1,000 planets orbiting around stars. We have never seen them. We have seen only one. Because they are so close to the central star that you cannot separate them. If you take the two of, of them, now I can separate them. But if I bring them at five kilometers from here, I, I, I would only say, well, there is one dot. I don't see them separated. The only way I have to tell that there is a planet is because of the spectral lines, and Gero Ruprecht will tell you more about that. It, they seem to wobble, because if you, if you imagine two stars circulating one around the other, one goes away and, go, and one comes in the other direction, so you have this blue and red shift, which wobbles continuously. But we have never seen a planet. Here, the challenge is we want to take an image of the planet, but we also want to take spectroscopy, which means we want to see the composition of the atmosphere of that planet. And that, of course, is the first step towards the tracing of the biomarkers. You want to see whether there is chlorophyll. You want to see whether there is oxygen, whether there is water, whether there is methane, which is a very strong biomarker of life, at least the life that we know. Then, of course, we want to probe the galaxies that today we cannot see. You know, the galaxies are clustered together, and there is a big cluster of galaxies some 40 million light years from Homas, the Virgo cluster, but we cannot distinguish the single stars. It's too far. And then we also want to study the history. You know that the telescope is a time machine in practice. You look very far 
in space, but you look also very, really back in time. And then, of course, the big questions about cosmology that we heard this morning. So how did the galaxies first form? Did really and how the universe decelerate? We have heard this morning that the, the, the supernovae observations, which led to the Nobel Prize, proved that the universe, or told us that the universe is accelerating rather than slowing down. This may be that there is the lambda constant or that there is the so-called dark energy. And let me tell you, if we really don't know what the dark matter is, we don't have a clue of what dark energy is. So this is the idea. So the site has been selected. It's 30 kilometers away from Cerro Paranal. It's called Cerro Armazonas. It's 3,000 meters. You can see it in a distance from Paranal. So this is now, well, actually, when the movie was done. And the first, it was supposed to start in 2011. The budget was not yet there. And it started now, so we are already one year late. So they will cut the mountain again. They will build the construction. This is 3,000 meters, and we are in the middle of the desert. They have to bring everything, electricity, water, people, and so on and so forth. It's very expensive. It's not like building the same thing here, which would not make any sense, by the way. So it is supposed to be finished by 2014, the civil infrastructure, and to enter operation in 2018. So this will be, as I said, the world's biggest eye on the sky. You see, each of those is a segment, is an hexagon, one meter across, and there are a thousand of them. So it will have a 40 meter class, it means that the area, the collecting area, is the equivalent of a mirror of a dish having a diameter of 40 meters. Again, that's a comparison. So because it's so big and because it will have a correction for the atmospheric effect, it will see details 15 times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope which is an amazing thing. So that it is how it will move. The concept is very similar to what I explained to you before. Although now we are talking about a mirror which starts here and ends there. And you have to imagine this kind of big swimming pool of aluminum moving and pointing to the stars. And the idea is to image Earth-like planets and study Jupiter-like planets, we, 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 they are big ones that we detect nowadays. Of course, we will look back in time. The bigger, the better. Why? It's the same as collecting water when it rains. If you pull out a bucket and it rains, you will collect maybe 10 liters in one hour. But if you have a swimming pool, you will collect 10,000 liters in the same time. That's the same idea. Photons are, are like drops of light. So the bigger your collecting area, the fainter, which means the farther away you are able to see. And there is one idea which is very challenging, is measuring the deceleration of the universe on the fly. The idea is that I take a set of quasars and I measure the position of their spectral lines. Now you are all experts about spectroscopy. So you measure today the position and you measure it again in 10 years from now. If the, the universe has decelerated, well, they should all move slowly. The difference is maybe a millimeter per second that you have to measure with a very high precision and you have to keep your instrument very, very stable. Of course, all of this will only work if we will be able to correct for the atmospheric effects. You know that the atmosphere acts in front of your eyes, deforming the shape of the... Of the it's like taking your camera and rather than keeping it steady, taking a picture, moving it like this, your picture will be blurred. The atmosphere does the same to you. So there are two ways of circumventing this problem. You go in space. We have heard this is possible. It's very expensive, though. And you cannot bring a 40-meter telescope in orbit. Or you use your brain and technology. So the idea is the following. <coughs> you analyze the light coming through the atmosphere. It's deformed. You take a mirror. And if the star goes that way, you move the mirror in the opposite direction. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So, in doing so, you correct the motion introduced by the atmosphere. But <clears throat> you have to do that a hundred times or a thousand times a second, because that's a fluctuation. So the idea is that you have the light coming through. It goes to a mirror which is as big as a meter, more or less, at some point and you deflect locally 
that mirror with piezos so that you deform it in the same way as the wave front is deformed, but with a negative sign, so that you move, the star moves that way, the mirror moves that way, and in the end, it stays there. If this works, which is technologically very challenging, that you will beat space telescope. Otherwise, we are in trouble. So, we have contacted already a civil engineering it's a challenging thing. You have to bring all the cranes up there, and every hour of a crane and water up there costs you money, so you have to optimize the thing. This is why astronomy now gets close to, you have the astronomers talking to the engineers, how much concrete and how you have to organize that on the mountain. And so there is a, a specific company that has done this estimate. You see the weeks running here, 10, 12, 13 weeks, how they mount and dismount the cranes and how they build the thing. <clears throat> now, we don't need to wait until the project is completed, but it takes, if I don't remember correctly, well, it's 180 weeks in total. So you see the year, now we are in 2013 here, week 91. So you see the cranes moving around, being, the movements are optimized. But now we are back to the stars, because all of this is because we want to watch the stars and the galaxies. And now I led through the Atacama Desert, but I also led you through, well, far back in time and in space. However, I want to close my presentation with something else, which is Earth. And this is also related to the emotional part. So, this is the Voyager. It's a NASA machine, which was sent out to the outer parts of the solar system at the beginning of the 70s. Now it's close to the edge, it's a hundred times more distant from the Sun than the Earth is. Carl Sagan, a very famous astronomer, that passed away a few years ago, was one of the scientific responsibles for this mission. At some point, after Saturn, he decided to take a picture of Earth. He didn't make any scientific sense, in fact, because there was nothing, we know everything that is about to know about Earth. And of course, at that distance, Earth would be just a small, tiny dot. However, he really wanted to take that picture. So, he convinced the bosses of NASA to turn the spacecraft camera, which is a bit dangerous because you have to avoid the sun, otherwise it would burn. You have to imagine that you are on the outskirts of the solar system, you are watching, the sun is on your shoulders, now you want to turn your spacecraft close to the sun because the Earth is rather close to the sun, and you take a picture. And the end this was accepted, and what Voyager did is a series of stamps on the sky, Neptune, Uranus, this Jupiter, Venus, Earth. This is where we are sitting. And that, actually no, that's Jupiter in fact. That's not even possible to read. And those are these stems that they took. Now, from that point, there's not very much to see. And if you zoom, I don't know whether you, it was supposed to be there, but there's a very small, tiny dot there. Now I can enlarge it for you a bit more. Is this, okay? That's where you're sitting, all of you. That's it. And I like to read this because this is scientifically and poetically very nice, I believe. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of all our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, 
Every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and exploder, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Actually, this sunbeam is just a geometrical and optical effect. There's a reflection of the sunlight on the Voyager which entered the picture, the same as when you take some pictures with the, very close to the sun. There's nothing real in that. There's nothing special about Earth. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent there are misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent they hate us. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all of this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. This was written in 2004, but this is true today as well, and probably will be true for the next 10 to 20 years. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes, as we have seen, curiosity, spirit, opportunity. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceit than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, and this is Carl Sagan speaking, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ferdinando. Um, we have time for a few questions, a couple questions, and we have some stickers and CDs and materials from the SO that you're welcome to take as well. So, any questions? Of course, if you have questions and you don't dare, you can write me at fpatat.iso.org and please also go to the, the ESO site. Here you find some material, there are DVDs and stickers and some flyers around. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. I want to know uh, how, how far we'll be able to see with the new telescope? Uh, objects that are uh, 10 billion years like uh, far away? This is a very difficult question because we exactly don't know the geometry of the universe, especially in the very early times. But it is going to be very close, a few hundred thousand years after the beginning of the Big Bang. So the idea, well, a few years ago we all thought that the galaxies had formed yesterday, basically. But the Hubble Space Telescope has shown us that there are galaxies all the way. So they must have formed at the very beginning, maybe one giga year, one, one billion years after the Big Bang. We want to go a bit further back than that, a, hundred, a few hundred thousands. So it's difficult to tell how much, you know, the, the, the diameter of, of the visible universe is 45 million years, uh, million li billion light years, more, more or less. So it's difficult to tell you exactly whether it is 39 or 40. But in time, the look back time is going to be close, although it's very far from the beginning, but close enough, we believe, to see the formation of the galaxies, which is a mystery. We don't know how they form. You know that at the beginning there was just gas. How you go from the gas, an homogeneous distribution, to what we see every day down to Earth scale, it's not understood. Yes. Hello. <laughs> I would like to, to know one thing. Is it 
Uh, is it possible to detect also, also um, asteroids to prevent the Earth from some impacts on the Earth, or is it not possible? Because this could be maybe a very challenging time to prevent the attacks or maybe the impact of astronauts in, in the Earth, because as you already see, the dinosaurs died maybe because of it, and maybe this could be also interesting to prevent or to find some, some tools yes. to, 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 to put the asteroids something Yes, not, not close to the Earth. This is, of course, a threat that hits the public very much. With our telescopes, this is not possible. It, you can make the comparison, like her camera having a very magnifying telelens with a very, very small field of view. So we are watching a very, very small, you know, this finger, when you keep a finger in the sky, like this, you can cover the full moon. It may be strange to you, but if you do it, you can cover the full moon. This is half a degree. Our fields of view here are a thousand times smaller than that, so it's very small. So there are projects which use the equivalent of a macro, or actually a fisheye, better said, that do that. They are small telescopes, they watch the sky, and they have identified a few of them already, and the most famous is called Apophis, which was an Egyptian divinity not, going, not doing anything good, and that intersects the orbit of Earth. Now, when you say an astronomy intersecting, it means that it's, very, it's much farther away from the Earth than, than the Moon. The Moon is much closer, so it, it is far. Still, it, at some point, it may, it may disturb the, the orbit of the Earth. So this is something which is done, and there are projects which are external to our organization. However, I must add to this, Okay, this year is very famous because of catastrophes, and we all like to hear about catastrophes. And, uh, however, I am afraid that Carl Sagan is right, and the biggest catastrophe on the planet is mankind. In the same time, it's also the most beautiful thing. But, yeah. One more, last five. Yes, one short question. Uh, how much uh, bigger than the actual Hubble telescope has to be a space telescope to achieve the ALT performance? Well, the, the JWST, which is the next generation, is a six-meter telescope that will compete because, you know, the, the, the resolution depends on the diameter of the mirror. That's true also for radio astronomy. That will compete, but they are built in such an intelligent way that they will be complementary. So there was some agreement because from space you can access wavelengths which are not accessible from the ground. That is something that from the ground you cannot beat. Fortunately, the ultraviolet does not go through the atmosphere and the far infrared also does not go through the atmosphere. But as far as the resolving power is concerned, if the ELT achieves the specifications, that will beat the JWST in the optical domain. Six meters is the diameter of this yeah. space yes. telescope. 6.4, I think. Oh, thank you. But still, the JWST will do, well, the impossible from the ground, which is observing the far infrared. There's no way. There is too much water in the atmosphere. There's no way. Okay, thank you very much. I guess uh, Ferdinando is around a little bit if you have any questions missing. And uh, thanks. Thanks again. Very nice presentation. Thank you.